Good afternoon. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to welcome the phenomenal Rajaram back to his home ground. Uh, and, uh, you know, I will uh, only say that I learned a lot from him ever since I was a student. And I hope to continue to do that. I will interact over the time that he's here. He's, of course, uh, very, very, you know, known to everyone for the kind of insights he is able to provide to your problems. I'll just hand over to Biman for a more formal introduction uh, to Rajaram, and uh, then we'll have his talk. So, good afternoon, uh, and welcome to this special colloquium today, uh, where we are delighted to have uh, Professor Rajaram Nitananda. Um, who doesn't need an introduction to this audience, at least in RRI, um, because we all know how invigorating it is to talk to him, to have him around, and his lectures are an absolute delight, uh, as you will see today, where he brings out uh, interesting uh, features in the familiar topics that we may have studied in, uh, you know, in college. For example, today's topic of diffraction. Um, uh, Rajaram, it's actually would not do justice to a uh, physicist like Rajaram to talk about what topics he has worked on because he's, I think, what we can call a total physicist. Uh, but still, um, he, um, after NAL, uh, he has been, he was in RRI for a long time, long time, um, and worked on, uh, uh, made fundamental contributions to topics on uh, galactic dynamics, um, astronomy, statistical physics, optics, and statistical physics and optics is probably some of the recurring themes uh, uh, in his work. And um, these are fundamental contributions. i just give an example, uh, the, the image that you may have all seen in EHT, uh, used uh, maximum entropy uh, methods that Rajaram has worked on um, uh, being here. Um, anyway, so after, um, RRI, he moved on to become the director of NCRA in Pune, after which um, he was in Azim uh, Premji University. He's also interested in, um, uh, in education, so uh, he has been the co-author, if I'm not mistaken, the NCRT uh, books, and also editor of Resonance, and now he's interested uh, uh, working on the undergraduate program of physics in uh, Azim Premji. So without uh, uh, further ado, uh, let me welcome Rajaram. Thanks, Biman. Uh, thanks, Tarun. It's interesting that when I moved to Pune, one of the things I look forward to and was uh, meeting Tarun. So, uniquely, he has welcomed me there and he's welcoming me back here. So, uh, as has been mentioned, I've been here a while, uh, many years ago. So, my feelings are summed up in this picture, which uh, some of you may know. You know, coming back. And uh, the, the good thing is that many things have changed, right? And, and that's the way it should be. So coming to uh, diffraction, what I hope to do is to do some history. I mean, if you get someone old enough, you will get history. <laughs> and then uh, maybe uh, m most of you are familiar with basics of diffraction. And so uh, I would try to help you to unlearn those a little bit. And that, uh, I, I have to confess that I was very happy with the conventional picture of diffraction when I came from NAL to RRI. And then in RRI, I had to face different kinds of radio telescopes. And uh, then I realized that one needs to go beyond that. But the main uh, focus in this talk will be on the optical principles. Of course, I, there will be some astronomy in it. And uh, it just turns out that uh, this more general view of diffraction is especially important for the kind of work which has been going on here uh, in the last decade, perhaps, right? So I'll come to all that. But to begin at the beginning, uh, here is the father of diffraction, uh, Grimaldi. And it's, it's nice that you go back to the history, he observationally had all the features. Apparently, let sunlight into a, a room through a small hole and sent it through another small hole and noticed all the features that we expect the spreading out into a cone rather than a shadow, 
uh, all kinds of intensity oscillations near the cone, colors there, so on. So purely observationally, this is well in place in the middle of the 17th century. When you come to the end, toward the end of the 17th century, we have these two major figures, uh, Newton and uh, Huygens. I thought for a change, I'll show you a different portrait of Newton. This is done by the artist uh, and uh, poet William Blake. And it's not meant to be complimentary. It <laughs> shows, it shows that the image that scientists have amongst uh, people from the humanities and so on has not changed from that time, right? He's a person wrapped up in his own thing, oblivious of everything else, you know, powerful, muscular, anyway. Uh, but the interesting thing to look at, which uh, I've looked at over the years, is uh, look at it in their own words. And then you realize that what we are told in the textbooks may be the truth, but it's not the whole truth. So if you look just at the cover, you see that uh, Newton talks of reflection, refraction, colors. He also talks of inflection, and that is his term for diffraction. So he, of course, repeated these observations. He knew that light bends into the shadow, okay, uh, into the shadow, okay. Uh, we think of Huygens uh, on, on the other side as uh, the pioneer of wave optics, but actually, uh, I, I, I didn't go through the French, but there is an English translation. By the way, a very late English translation, 1912, and uh, the preface of that translation says, Perhaps because of the influence of Newton, Huygens' book was never translated into English up to now. So uh, I could not find in it uh, any reference to wavelength or phase or anything of that kind. He was certainly inspired by waves. I think all of you know his famous geometric construction. Okay, But uh, essentially his construction is a beautiful way of constructing rays. Okay, And he put it to good effect. So even on the cover, you, you see he talks of the crystal from Iceland, which is calcite, which shows uh, double refraction and so on, okay? So that is Newton and Huygens, right? So Newton, on the other hand, actually had a length associated with each color of light, which is longer for red light. And because after all, Newton observed Newton's rings, right? And the colors of thin films. Uh, so it, it's not... It's not clear. I mean, some of the aspects of wave optics were actually better appreciated by Newton, even though he didn't use the word waves. And interestingly, that includes polarization. Now, Huygens didn't say anything about polarization. And Newton said, made this interesting remark that the phenomena in calcite show that light has some sides. I mean, that's the word he used. But by, and he explains that sides really means two possible things in the transverse plane. So anyway, as I said, the real truth about these two is more interesting and more complicated than just saying that someone is rays and someone is waves. So move forward a whole century and that's interesting, right? That almost nothing happened for a hundred years uh, regarding uh, light waves and so on. And this is uh, young and uh, just for fun, I've reproduced this picture. I mean, it's a very commonplace picture, but this is Young's original picture, which you can dig out from the internet nowadays, of uh, two beam interference. Okay. Um, we'll come back to Young's views on diffraction later, but I thought I could mention in passing a recent uh, biography of Young. And if you Google the last man who knew everything, it'll throw up two biographies. One is Young and one is uh, Fermi, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. So, of course, we have heard of his modulus, we have heard of his work on surface tension and so on. But uh, quite outside uh, physics, he deciphered ancient scripts and he was a practicing doctor, an amazing man, uh, also a skilled gymnast. But clearly, uh, the person we are going to really get into is uh, Fresnel, uh, roughly contemporary, on the other side of the English Channel. And as I said, this very comfortable, familiar theory of diffraction in which you uh, take the incident wave and it's blocked by some, you know, some screen, but there's a hole in that screen of any shape you like. And uh, you want to know what happens beyond that hole. So you add up contributions from everywhere. Okay. Now, uh, 
this is usually called Huygens principle, not completely fair because Huygens ultimately chose only one point on the wave where it was tangent to the wave front, whereas uh, Fresnel uh, wanted you to sum up everything with proper phases. So we are really talking of a more modern picture of diffraction. Um, he actually gave a very nice qualitative picture, intuitive picture, which is uh, sometimes not taught. Uh, it used to be fashionable, but it's very old fashioned now. In fact, believe it or not, I learnt it uh, not when I was studying physics, but uh, my neighbor who, was, uh, who had just joined medicine was given a textbook and told to ask me why Madras University wanted uh, you know, a future doctor to know about half period zones. But here is the construction. You have a source, you have a receiver, and uh, there is some aperture which is not sketched. And you have this uh, shortest path. And then on this uh, screen you can draw uh, points, all of which arrive here in the same phase. And just from the geometry it is pretty clear these will form uh, circles. Okay? Of course that phase will be different for different circles. And uh, Fresnel suggested, why don't you draw the circle such that the phase keeps increasing by pi, by 180 degrees, as you go from one circle to the next. So these are the famous uh, Fresnel zones. Okay? So if you want to think qualitatively, you just cancel out all the Fresnel zones, <laughs> alternate ones, and then whatever is left, you know, is, is your contribution. This is a nice intuition, uh, quite useful even today. But of course, he didn't stop there, right? Um, he actually wrote down this object F, which I'd like to talk about for some time. Now, one of my recollections from RRI is that you used to project there, so you could use the board. <laughs> uh, it may put everyone to too much inconvenience, right, to use the board. But maybe I can, is this little corner of the board visible? I may not need more than that. Yeah? yeah? Okay. So, uh, just explain the symbols. So, X prime is some point on the screen, you are trying to measure something at x and of course you have this uh, contribution, right? The spherical wave spreading out from x prime to x. Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah, uh, is my audible? Yeah, right. So it's this picture which is implemented in that equation. So f is really the contribution from some point x prime, and of course, in two dimensions it would be x prime y prime at some point x y. And a couple of approximations have gone in here. Right, uh, the expression you may be more used to uh, looks like this. The amplitude falls as 1 over r, and uh, k is, of course, 2 pi over the wavelength. Right? So, one is uh, making a couple of approximations. The r in the denominator uh, is taken not to vary much. Okay? So, if this is z0 and this is z, you just replaced it by that uh, difference. But, of course, you can't do that in the numerator because it's very sensitive. You know, a change of r by even half a wavelength makes a big difference. So then what you do is, you uh, you are really concerned with the variation of the phase here, so you just look at this, right, which is the gap between a sphere and a plane, which is what is sitting up there, right, uh, x minus x prime whole square, y minus y prime whole square. So this is the famous uh, Fresnel diffraction kernel, and the reason why it's called a kernel is that you uh, stick in this f, and then you integrate over the aperture, right? And you integrate for a uniform illumination, you just integrate over the part which is not obstructed, okay? So, but you need not have uniform illumination. You might have some variation of phase, so all that's fine. Hmm? But this is the essential part of the th Fresnel's theory of diffraction, okay? And I've called it the paraxial paradise. Because you have already seen, I am assuming these angles are small. Okay? 
So that's what paraxial means in optics. So th these angles are small. And I'm calling it a paradise because you can really extract so much physics from this, okay, which I don't propose to do. Uh, you could do, give a whole course on that. Uh, I again, like to repeat that this is sub often called the Fresnel Huygens, <laughs> but no, uh, no mention of phase. And as I said, Huygens would simply tell you that if you start here, then this is the only point you need to worry about, right? Whereas Fresnel is telling you uh, do an integral, okay? So there are many nice ideas. The first consistency check, of course, is that if there is no obstacle, you can integrate over the entire screen, and then nothing should happen. I mean, if it's a plane wave coming in, it should just be a shifted plane wave coming here. So, so that's consistency check. It passes, okay? And that also gives you an interesting principle that, uh, so if the entire integral is straightforward, then if you integrate, say, over a hole, that's the same. Uh, and if you add then the integral over the other part, those two will add up to just the original plane wave, okay? So this is the so-called Babinet principle that uh, if you want to understand a hole, uh, you could also, uh, if you want to understand an obstacle, all you have to do is to work out the corresponding hole and the two answers will be the same apart from, of course, the original uh, direct beam, okay? And uh, there are entire fields of optics, Fourier optics, you know, Gaussian optics and so on, which all come out of this. Ah. The IK factor, how does it uh, come? Um, okay, one way to think about it is, you could just put a unknown constant there, and then if you put this consistency check, that a plane wave should remain a plane wave, you will find that this has to be IK. But the other way to look at it is that, uh, remember this is going to be integrated over area, right? So, and the exponent has no dimensions. So whatever is in front has to have some dimensions, right? Uh, dimensions of one over area. And the one over R comes from just spherical waves. So, so what else is there except the wavelength, right? Anyway, different ways of doing it. Hmm? So that's, so this is just to tell you that you can go a very long way with this formulation of diffraction. But as you have realized, I have come here not to praise Fresnel, but to bury him, so to speak, right? Uh -huh. so, so coming back to my stay in NAL, this was good enough for the kind of optics uh, that we were doing, right? But there are some worries about this. Hmm? Now, I think it's a tribute to the power of uh, brainwashing that we've all been told from very early that Huygens is a great man. Every point on the wavefront acts as a source, secondary source. You say it often enough and it seems natural. But is it natural for empty space to act as a source of waves? And the answer is no. Of course, there are alternate ways of deriving that which don't make this assumption, but still. And in particular, one person who was very unhappy with this was uh, Young. Okay? Uh, so he had his own way of looking at diffraction, which we will uh, come to. So uh, let us say we are talking of one of the simplest problems of diffraction, which we'll come to later, the so-called straight edge, right? So uh, extends in this direction, and the wave is coming from this direction, right? So uh, Fresnel would tell you that if you want to know what's happening here, do some integral, which happens to be a Fresnel integral over this part. And the value will depend on where this point is. If you're somewhere here, it's very small. And if you go up, if you go far up, its value is essentially one, the amplitude of the incoming wave, okay? Now what Young tells you is something different. He says, look, I don't like all this, okay? The wave is really coming from the edge, okay? So there's a wave coming from the edge. And if you happen to live here, there's also a wave coming from the source. It's very intuitive, of course, right? So in this region, what you see is the interference between this edge wave and the direct wave. Uh, so for example, the path difference would be something like this. And believe it or not, you get the correct location of the maxima by doing this. In this region, you only see the edge wave. Okay. Now, of course, he didn't tell you what the strength of the edge wave is. 
there is an experimental observation which goes back to Grimaldi actually and actually to the favorite observation even of the founder of this institute. If you go to the diffraction pattern, put yourself there and look through an eyepiece. What do you see? So, so Grimaldi actually saw a bright line on this edge. And uh, I'm, I'm not going into Raman's contributions to diffraction with his star student uh, G.N. Ramchandran. So they went further and they had elliptic apertures and located, it was dominated by some bright points. So this edge wave seems to have some physical justification. Now it, it seems so irreconcilable with the other picture. I want to give you one example where you can easily see it happening. And uh, this is the diffraction pattern of a single slit and also far away, the so-called uh, Fraunhofer pattern, right? So it, uh, right, uh, theta is the angle and A is the width of the slit and K is the good old uh, 2 pi over lambda. So the formula we are used to by integrating over the slit is that sine Ka by 2 by Ka by 2. But you can also write it in the other way. So then it looks like a wave coming from one edge and a wave coming from the other edge. But interestingly, the amplitude of the strength of this wave varies very strongly with theta. So the young edge wave is something slightly peculiar, right? <coughs> it increases as 1 over theta, right? And then again falls off as you go here. And it's actually true that in the straight edge pattern, the oscillations fall off. <coughs> the other worry is more theoretically minded physicists came in. By the middle of the 19th century, you had a perfectly good wave equation. Uh, by the way, I have to confess that I am going to more or less ignore polarization, which for me is something of an effort, but I will still <laughs> ignore polarization. So in some sense, you could say this whole talk is about sound waves, <laughs> not entirely. Uh, some people uh, with a conscience said, look, uh, Fresnel is fine, works very well, but you should be able to get it all out of the wave equation because we have a wave equation. So here are uh, some of the personalities involved. So on the left you have uh, Kirchhoff and next to him you have Helmholtz who looks every bit as dignified as you would imagine from everything you heard about him. And uh, so they wrote down something which no one could quarrel with, a mathematical identity satisfied by solutions of the wave equation. Okay. So and from it they derived the Fresnel recipe in some limit. Okay. But of course, in that derivation, uh, they had to do a few things. So let me just sketch that out again. I will not even write down their formula, which is called the Helmholtz Kirchhoff integral. But I will tell you the equation, which this is called the Helmholtz equation. It looks like the wave equation, except it's simplified because you're dealing only with a single frequency. So no need to do d squared by dt squared. You just do omega squared over c squared. So this is the Helmholtz equation and solutions to it satisfy an interesting identity that you can express the value anywhere in terms of uh, say phi and the normal derivative of phi on this boundary. Okay? And that's an identity, you cannot quarrel with it. Okay? However, when they actually applied it to diffraction and in particular Kirchhoff, he had to make some assumptions, right? So if this is his screen, he, uh, he defines something called phi star, which is what comes from the source which is behind the screen. Okay? Then, uh, so he assumes that this phi has the value phi star here, uh, assumes that it has the value 0 here, and very important, assumes that here you have only outgoing waves. right? So you don't have, you have no sources over there. So uh, many of you might have seen in textbooks this so-called Kirchhoff integral. And Kirchhoff's integral, uh, it even remedies one of the defects of the Huygens principle that, you know, it also gives you a backward wave, but Kirchhoff doesn't. However, again, it's sort of nice, you prepare for a lecture, you can dig into the internet and so I thought in Kirchhoff's own words, you can see what he said, right? So the first part is fine that on that aperture, assume that you're dealing with the uh, whatever is coming from the source. 
But on the next, not only does he put phi equal to 0, he has to put the normal derivative also equal to 0. And this does uh, violence to mathematics because it is a theorem. Uh, maybe it was not fully appreciated at that time, but if you have this Helmholtz equation or Laplace equation, if you put both the function and its normal derivative equal to 0, even on a tiny stretch, it has to be 0 everywhere. Okay? So clearly, uh, what he was doing was inconsistent. But nothing succeeds like success. So uh, Kirchhoff integral is present in all optics textbooks. Okay? Um, but a few people realize that you have to go further. Okay? So I have, uh, so this is uh, Rayleigh and this is Sommerfeld. I have to confess, why didn't I put up a picture of Sommerfeld? And the reason is uh, that same picture was used by the artist of resonance to create this back cover of the May 2015 issue. So this is a little commercial plug for the magazine uh, resonance, if you like. Um, so these two people uh, came up with another version. It turns out that this identity can be used in many ways, identity derived by. So they used it in a different way, so that they only had to put phi equal to 0 or d phi dn equal to 0, but not both. So that's called the Rayleigh-Sommerfeld theory of diffraction. But you should be suspicious when someone gives you two different answers to the same question. Okay? And, uh, so there uh, matters stood. And finally, Sommerfeld decided to do something about it. Okay? So it's the first, I like to call it the first theory of diffraction without any holes in it. Okay? And he did this in 1897, and he did it for what I would regard as absolutely the simplest problem, and it's very hard to do it beyond that point, which is the straight edge. Okay, so let's go to the straight edge. So this is the straight edge, and you could have a plane wave coming from any direction. He could do both polarizations. Okay, so no problem. And his point was, let's make this a perfect conductor and let's use Maxwell's equations. So put the proper boundary conditions, right? If uh, you have the electric field sticking out of the board, it had better be zero on both these surfaces. And uh, if you have the magnetic field uh, sticking out of the board, then you have to ensure that the normal component of the electric field is, you know, electric field is normal to the surface and so on, okay? So, um, I'm not going to tell you about the Sommerfeld straight edge solution. I mean, I'm not going to write it down, but I tell you things about it. Okay? So uh, most textbooks on optics, say uh, Bond, Bond's textbook on optics, for example, or uh, the Landau Lifshitz volume, say <laughs> by some magic, you know, Sommerfeld wrote down he did this. So what does Sommerfeld himself say? You can go to his book on optics, and he was considered one of the great teachers. So it takes him about 15 pages or maybe 12 pages to start from formulating the problem and then using some very interesting non-trivial mathematics. Uh, and then he ends up with an expression. At that point, he throws up his hands and says, now I have to do some transformations which are too complicated to explain here. And then he comes up with quite a manageable expression which actually has these famous Fresnel integrals in it and so on and uh, then explores it. So in the forward direction, it pretty much reproduces the Fresnel theory. But that single expression does everything. It uh, takes care of the incident wave. It takes care of the wave which is reflected here. It takes care of the shadow region. It takes care of... So it's, it's a masterpiece of uh, mathematical physics. And uh, But what do you do with that? Because uh, later on in the same book, he discusses why it's very non-trivial to extend it to other things. Nevertheless, I think the community learnt a lot of lessons from this. But, of course, I can't resist throwing in a little astronomy here. Uh, this is the straight edge pattern. And those of you who know my experimental skills will guess that this was just produced by a computer simulation. Right? Both the, the grayscale as well as the graph. But this one is a genuine straight edge diffraction pattern. Played a very historic role in astronomy. So it so happened that uh, there was a very mysterious object called 3C273 sometime in the early 1960s, picked up by the Cambridge and people. And uh, uh, people didn't know its position very accurately because it was a radio source. So uh, 
fortuitously the moon passed in front of it and uh, this is the record of the diffraction pattern okay looks pretty much like the theory uh, it's not exactly the same and you see this bump and so on uh, because it's not a point source right in fact uh, it's an art to deduce the source structure from this pattern you know we are all used to a point source being convolved by some nice function and then you can deconvolve it but suppose a point source is convolved with this function how do you deconvolve it so the most elegant solution was given by an astronomer called peter scheuer the most practical solution was given by uh, cr subramania who many of you may have seen that was part of his uh, phd thesis which uh, fortunately came to rri for being examined not by me so i learned about all this early on so i just thought and then of course uh, the uti radio astronomy group built this uh, magnificent telescope so people who have not seen it should go and see it and its job was to follow the edge of the moon and pick up any source which happened to be covered up by the moon and they produced a catalog of hundreds of sources structure of these sources a lot of interesting astronomy came out of this but that's really a digression having mentioned the straight edge i i thought i should not uh, miss these points so coming back to the lessons uh basically you should avoid buzzwords like diffraction and treat it like a scattering problem and that's why i threw in really because not in the context of diffraction but in the context of say a, you know a drop of water or something like that he had already formulated scattering theory in the way that we formulate it today you should have an incident wave right and uh, far away you should have some outgoing wave which could depend in some interesting way on angle and you have to of course match everything in the region around this and uh, he formulated this basically for sound but also for light in some approximations right and the other reason of course for choosing really and helm holds is that uh, as you know the founder of this institute did not have a phd degree or a phd guide but uh, the two names he mentions as having inspired him are indeed really and helm holds so i certainly had to bring them in okay now in the case of uh, the sommerfeld solution it's very clear that the reflected and diffracted waves <laughs> come from currents which flow in the sheet but you don't know those currents in advance right uh, the boundary conditions tell you that if you know the tangential component of the magnetic field you know the current but how do you know the tangential component of the magnetic field only if you know all the currents <laughs> right which flow everywhere so it's a self consistent uh, problem okay now interestingly the sommerfeld solution has an edge wave <laughs> okay if you go into the geometric shadow it it has a cylindrical wave emanating from the edge but sommerfeld also makes an interesting remark he says the eye performs an inadmissible extrapolation which is a little hard to pronounce and what he means is that this is the asymptotic form and your eye is located there so the eye thinks that it's emanating from the edge but the currents actually are not confined to the edge right they actually over a small region if you go closer you have a more complicated picture okay but certainly this uh, is more physical than you know now the other nice remark which sommerfeld makes is <laughs> let's look at the field uh, in this region right it will have the incident wave but it will also have contributions from all these currents so he actually plots it out and it has all kinds of oscillations so that is again you know uh, saying that look people like kirchhoff and really and himself earlier had said that here it's the field of the original incident wave but it's nothing like that so it's the it's either good luck or the fact that you know di different functions when you integrate them may look the same okay in any case exactly completely so that that is again see all the earlier theories like uh, kirchhoff and so on they just said put something equal to zero of course kirchhoff says something more which i didn't i should have 
been alert enough to spot it. He says, go back to my earlier lecture on the black body. <laughs> okay? And as you know, Kirchhoff was the king of black bodies. So he said, I'm going to put this equal to zero. So, but that's only intuitive. In reality, you have to put boundary conditions and if the screen has some resistance, you have to put that in. So, diffraction does depend on the material of the screen. Uh, absolutely. So, now uh, let's come back to this theme of superposition, right? We are all told that, you know, uh, Huygens principle, superposition, uh, it's all, as I said, that was the brainwashing. Hmm? And uh, none less than uh, Feynman Lectures, Volume 3, 1, <laughs> uh, told you that if you have two slits, you first see what happens with one slit, you have some wave coming out, then see what happens with the other slit by itself, another wave, add them. Okay. Now, <laughs> of course, Feynman was lecturing to, you know, well, not undergraduate, I think, yeah, second year or third year, whatever. So clearly, he knew when to simplify. Uh, I'm not accusing Feynman of being unaware of this fact. But if you ask mathematically what you're doing, you're doing something very strange, right? So let me again put a small sketch. There is a superposition principle, of course. So you can solve this problem or you can solve uh, another problem which has a screen like this. Now, no one told you that you can superpose two solutions of two different problems, right? It's not guaranteed. <laughs> Or if you are more used to Schrodinger equation, which the way the educational system works, people probably see Schrodinger's equation first. <laughs> you can, given the same potential, you can superpose two solutions. But you give me two different potentials, I have no right to superpose solutions, right? Now, interestingly, uh, obviously Feynman was aware of this because he had this nice idea, which is expounded in his book and also in his 1948 paper, of a sum over parts. So you have all kinds of paths going from here to here. Likewise, all kinds of paths going from here to here via this. But the moment you open both, in principle, you have paths like this. And I know some of the work in RRI has actually emphasized this. Okay. But I'm just saying this for a broader audience. So this is another way of seeing that uh, there is no superposition principle if you open you know, two holes or if you have two scatterers or anything like that. Right? Because they are coupled. And this is particularly clear if you have two wires, right? So waves scatter off one wire, they scatter off the other wire, but the second wire also scatters the waves scattered from the first wire and so on and so forth, right? Now again, on the same theme of Feynman lectures, there is a superposition principle, right? Uh, in the kind of problems we are interested in. And I mean, this is a... I do not know if it's successful pedagogically, but it's an intellectual feat that in Feynman Lectures Volume 1, which was given to these raw undergraduates who had just learned calculus and algebra and so on, he actually gives you the most general principle, which is valid. Okay? Uh, he doesn't even have Maxwell's equations, but he says, I don't need Maxwell's equations. I will give you the formula for an arbitrarily moving charge, and that's good enough. And I also give you the formula for if some other charge feels these fields, what it does. So he does that. And then he says, and this is the linearity of Maxwell's equations, if you like. Find all the sources, all the currents, let us say, in our language, moving charges. And the field anywhere is the sum of those currents. But the, the catch is, you don't know those currents, as we saw in the... You may know the current which produces that original wave which is getting scattered or diffracted, right? But then it induces currents elsewhere and they couple with each other. So, uh, I guess I don't want to labor the point, so I've just uh, lifted that passage from <laughs> Feynman Lectures, Volume 1, right? Where he, you can look at the part in boldface, right? So, it's a non-trivial problem, but today, in fact, electromagnetic codes, which people use, uh, some of those codes actually do that. They assume some current distribution and then make it self-consistent, okay? Now, as with many things in the Feynman lectures, this idea has uh, origins many years earlier. And uh, so I'd like to mention it briefly because it kind of leads on to the kind of radio astronomy, radio telescope, I should say, applications that I have in mind. <laughs>
So around 1915, Ewald is a student of Sommerfeld, better known for his contributions to crystallography. Osin is well known for his contribution to liquid crystals. But they both came up with this idea independently, uh, which is really based on this notion that the field anywhere is the sum of the fields due to all sources, uh, the original source as well as the induced sources. And we look at absolutely the simplest example. Huh? So uh, no diffraction here. You have a screen with no holes in it and you have a wave. It's perfectly conducting, so you get a reflected wave, right? So the usual way of thinking about it is that, uh, you know, this wave reflected everything, so it doesn't transmit anything. So in this region, you have zero field. But if you believe in this principle that the field at any place has to be calculated by taking all sources into account, then this original source over here is definitely producing a field here. So now the picture is not a metal screen blocks uh, radiation. That's that's not the picture. That's a kind of macroscopic picture, right? So I want to know the field here. This current produces field here. So there must be some other currents which cancel, and they have to cancel. If you get zero here, they have to cancel. In this case, it's very easy to see they cancel, because whatever currents flow in this, which I think I have an arrow over there, right? They radiate this reflected wave, right? Let's say it's a very thin sheet, so the same currents will produce a, an identical wave in this direction, right? And that's the one which cancels the incident wave. Now, what these gentlemen did was to show that this cancellation is a very general property. If you enter, you know, if light goes from uh, air to glass, I mean, a question we never ask, right? Uh, what happened to the incident wave when you go into the glass? Simple answer is, uh, in glass, uh, the rules are different. But that's a kind of differential equation point of view, right? You solve Maxwell's equation in glass, and it tells you things propagate at a different speed. Nothing wrong with it, but it's a very piecemeal way of looking at things. Whereas this way of looking at things is, the whatever currents flow in the glass, which is the polarization of the atoms in the glass, they do two things. <laughs> well, three things actually. They generate the refracted wave, they generate the reflected wave, and they cancel the incident wave. And believe it or not, <laughs> in Feynman lectures, uh, volume one, he uses this extinction property because he says it has to be so, to even calculate the so-called uh, Fresnel coefficients, the, you know, what is the strength of the reflected wave and the refracted wave, right? That, that's, again, an intellectual feat. It's generally recorded that his lectures made more sense to the faculty than to the students, but in any case, this is a brilliant, uh, brilliant piece of, of course, he doesn't prove the extinction theorem, but he uses it, as I said, before Maxwell's equations, anything. So, so when I came to RRI, they were, this telescope was being built. Uh, in fact, both were being built, I think. So I had to, this one I'm not going to say so much about because the wavelength is 2.6 millimeters or even if it was a few centimeters later, uh, the diameter is 10.4 meters. So uh, the usual pictures work pretty well. You can think of it as a parabolic reflector, do all the usual things. But uh, this kind of telescope is a little harder to understand. So we used to take students to this Gauri Bidanur uh, radio telescope, summer school students. So they would get down from the bus and look at this and say, where is the telescope? Okay. <laughs> uh, so I used to say that the telescope consists of dipoles uh, mounted on monopoles. The monopoles are, of course, just these poles, which I think are Kashurina, right? Dwarka? Kashurina poles. Uh, and uh, you don't... These, these are the dipoles, right, somewhere here. You barely see them. And something you don't see at all, which is the reflector under the dipoles, is uh, a king's ransom in copper wire. I mean, it may not have been a king's ransom at that time, but it is now. I hope the word doesn't get out <laughs> from this auditorium. Okay. So all your intuition about <laughs> telescopes, diffraction kind of breaks down, right, when you are confronted with this. But fortunately, uh, people with an electrical engineering background, and there were people like that, uh, like, uh, you know, Deshpande, uh, Shivgaonkar, and so on. I mean, and of course, there was Radhakrishnan, who had his own unique background. So let me tell you a couple of general things you can say, even when you're dealing with uh, 
such an unconventional uh, telescope. Okay. Well, unconventional as compared to the dish. So the most fundamental question you could ask is, what is its collecting area? How much energy? Uh, if you have a source which gives you so many watts per square meter, how many watts will come out of the two wires which come out of the telescope? So the conversion factor is clearly something with the dimensions of meter square. It's called the effective area. And one tends to think of it as the geometric area. But what's the geometric area of a dipole? It's, it's a very thin object, right? Nevertheless, uh, this effective area obeys a theorem. Okay? And uh, let me state the theorem. So what the theorem says is, if you do your best, you ensure there are no losses, no reflections, nothing. Then, so now let's say this is the sky, right? And you have something here. Right? So it has an effective area which is a function of angle. Right? So what this says is that if you integrate this effective area with respect to solid angle, and actually everywhere, including <laughs> below, if the telescope is in space, right? It's just lambda squared. Now you can easily check this for some simple rectangular aperture because the solid angle is something by lambda by d into lambda by d, right? Or old-fashioned intuition about diffraction that if you have something of size d, it diffracts into an angle lambda by d. Uh, by the way, I have uh, changed gears and that is something I had to get used to when I came here to RRI that uh, radio astronomers use the language of radiation even though they are receiving, okay? So, uh, for whatever sits at the focus is called a feed, as which is feeding the telescope. Maybe historically, because they all worked in radar, you know, that's how that terminology came in. So in any case, when I say uh, it really diffracts the incident wave, but you can also think of radiation falling on it and going outwards as diffraction. No? And the logic behind this is a principle of reciprocity, which is also a pretty sacred principle, that you can have a source somewhere and a receiver somewhere and any, anything in between, <laughs> and you have reciprocity, which, right, you can radiate from here and pick up there, or you can radiate from there and pick up here. Okay. So this is the theorem. As I said, for the dishes, it works out easily. Lambda by d whole squared into d squared is lambda squared. But it works. And the logic behind it is, uh, at least the way it was explained to me, was uh, thermodynamic, which is a bit mysterious. It says you put this uh, telescope inside a black body. Of course, today we know that the telescope is indeed inside a black body at a temperature of some 3 degrees Kelvin, right? And then what it will pick up if this black body is, is a, what you would call a global signal, you know, something coming from all directions, then it uh, picks up exactly the left-hand side, right? Whatever the A effective is, averaged over all, integrated over all solid angles, right? Um, and if the black body is at some temperature T, then what it gives you from any direction is KT over lambda squared. That's the Rayleigh Jeans formula. So uh, you can't collect more than KT because if you collected more, you could use, you could extract energy from this black body and put it into a hotter. I mean, that's the reasoning I was given. Okay, there are. <laughs> now it's sort of interesting that why would you need to go to thermodynamics to deduce a property which is purely electromagnetic? And actually, there are ways of doing it. We don't rely on this argument. But those of you who uh, knew the person, uh, Radhakrishnan, also known as Rad, would know that he had a special fondness for the laws of uh, thermodynamics. So in any case, this is a theorem. Okay? But what's really interesting is that this effective area may have nothing to do with the physical area. Okay? So I have uh, used this phrase, uh, super gain. So super gain antenna is something that you can pack into a small region, but is able to collect radiation from much larger region. And again, there's a theorem. <laughs> the theorem says that give me any wavelength, single wavelength, give me uh, any effective area which you want, and then restrict me to a box of any size. <laughs> and I will give you some complicated thing inside that box, which will receive at that wavelength with that effective area. So that is super gain. So the proof of the theorem, for those of you who have encountered the multipole expansion, is uh, very simple. You take the angular pattern which you want, break it up into multipoles. Huh? Now, let's take the dipole, which is one of the simpler ones. You can 
Usually dipoles are lambda by 2, but they don't have to be, right? Uh, we know from the dipole that you can keep increasing the charge or the current and keep shrinking the size and far away it will still look like a dipole. The same holds for all the higher poles. You can keep shrinking their size, but keep increasing the currents. So please, uh, so super gain is not a practical principle, but it's an interesting idea. That, uh, but my favorite example of super gain, and uh, since, uh, yeah, it's a limit, right? I mean, this lambda squared is a limit. Now let's take a hydrogen atom in its ground state, okay? Its physical size is around one angstrom or something like that. Now, if you illuminate it with uh, Lyman alpha radiation at resonance, which is uh, 1 s to 2 p, which is, I don't know, 121.6 nanometers or something like that, right? I had to convert from angstrom, sorry. Hmm? You can ask what its cross-section is. And believe it or not, it's, it's uh, hundreds of square angstroms, okay? And that's what makes uh, neutral hydrogen such a powerful tool uh, in the ultraviolet, observed in the ultraviolet, okay? So you, you can just check that. You can go and look up the cross-section. So it is a super gain antenna in that sense. Um, what happens, you may say, but why, why is this not depending on the property? It's just lambda squared with some factors. Why is it not depending on the properties of the atom? And the answer is in this fine print which says it has to be exactly at resonance. Now what happens if you change the properties of the atom is the width of that line will change. So the total absorption will definitely depend on the property of the atom. But the maximum absorption at resonance Ideal conditions, the thing is not moving around, nothing else is disturbing it, will be lambda squared, <laughs> independent of the properties of the atom, which is interesting. Uh, you might worry about a paradox, right? So I have one hydrogen atom and it absorbs from this area. So what happens if I pack hydrogen atoms close? Will they collect more than <laughs> the total area? They can't, right? So the answer is, the moment you put two hydrogen atoms together, their properties for radiation or absorption changes. Right? They get coupled to each other. So we come back to this theme of coupling. You, you, you cannot. Right? The same is true of two dipoles. Right? A dipole may have a cross-section of, say, I think lambda squared by 8 or something. So you may say, okay, I'm going to pack a whole lot of dipoles very close to each other. And will I be able to collect a huge amount, more than what falls on it? And the answer is no. So this gets us to the theme of Coupling. <laughs> and that's something one normally doesn't worry about in uh, paraxial optics, right? So now I uh, come to the last part of the talk, which is about a very specific uh, radio telescope. And this is one which was built in RRI. This doesn't look like a radio telescope, right? It looks like a wire grid, right? Uh, uh, I also should apologize to the people involved. I, I think if Raghu is here, I apologize to him, <laughs> so on. Uh, because the radiation from the sky is coming from below, okay? So let's say this is in Australia or something. But anyway, this is one. <laughs> this is one and it splits into an R and a T, okay? Now, of course, you could also send in something from the other side, right? Hmm. Right. You could send in something from this side, right? So in general, if you just send in some E1 and E2 from here, if you want to know what comes out, you will have to multiply this E1, E2 by a matrix. And this is the famous scattering matrix, S matrix, right? And for this very simple case, you have T, R, R, T. That's, that's all it is, right? In other words, if you look to the left, you see the reflected part of what comes from the left and the transmitted part of what comes from the right, and vice versa. So what can you say about this uh, S matrix, right? So you can uh, say the energy conservation, which is uh, this. The bar is complex conjugate because these are amplitudes. They have phases. So if you want to know intensities, you should multiply by the complex conjugate. Okay? Now there is, but this is not the whole story, which is uh, pretty interesting. Uh, energy conservation also constrains the relative phase between R and T. So, so let me... Just explain this argument, but it doesn't take very long. See, it should conserve energy no matter what you put onto it, not just from one side, okay? So let's put one from here and let's put one from here. 
Now, of course, the whole setup is so symmetric that you will get uh, R plus T here and R plus T here. But look, if you have to conserve energy, uh, this could have any phase it likes. But its amplitude should be 1 because it's the same as this. So you should have 1 times some phase and 1 times the same phase coming out from this side. Okay. So what does this tell you? It tells you, uh, you can omit a factor of 2. It tells you that R plus T into its complex conjugate also equals 1. So you expand it out. You get the old part, R, R bar, T, T bar, which is 1. So the rest has to add up to 0. Okay, that's, that's as simple as that. And the only way this can happen, these two terms are complex conjugate. Uh, but the sum is 0, so it's pure imaginary, right? So, so that's how you get this. Now, this pure imaginary actually has an interesting influence on the astronomical use of this setup. Now, I'm not getting deep into astronomy, okay? But the idea was, the idea of this experiment, which was performed here, is that, okay, let, let, me, let me put the sky in the right place. And then there are these two uh, receivers here. And the idea of this experiment was to measure the sum of the intensities coming from here. Now, two things in the sky are not coherent. In the previous example, that one and one were coherent, okay? But here they're not. So what you do is you measure the correlation between these two. Okay. So this one, for example, will create a correlation of R with, uh, right? So this will create an R here and a T here, right? And so when you correlate, what do you do? You take this E1 and E2 and you do something like E1. In other words, you look at the phase difference and so on. And you average this. I'm, I'm not getting into radio interferometry and so on. And the interesting question is, will you be able to detect this signal, uh, which is coming from all directions, this global signal? By the way, the two outstanding examples are the cosmic microwave background and this uh, neutral hydrogen from the epoch of reionization, which I'm sure, I hope, all of you have heard about because so many people here worked on it. But this I actually <laughs> makes the whole answer zero, okay? In fact, the combination you get is precisely T bar R. Uh, by the way, the people who worked on it, that paper has uh, excited a lot of interest. Uh, in fact, I heard about it sitting in far away uh, Pune from Ron Eakers, who got so excited that he came to Pune and told us all about it. Uh, yeah, the people who did this, the paper is cited as MSU, which is uh, Mahesh and uh, Subramaniam, which is Ravi Subramaniam and Uday Shankar. And maybe they were restricted to three letters because they left out R, which is Raghu, whose PhD thesis was this. They knew that this was going to happen and therefore they did something which radio astronomers have tremendous resistance to do. Right? They, namely, they actually made this resistive. Okay? By the way, one much simpler way of seeing, uh, maybe I should have just done that, the phase relationship between R and T is to say that R square plus T square has to be 1, but in complex, the complex number R plus T also has to add up to 1, right? So uh, by, by Pythagoras theorem, uh, this and this have to be at 90 degrees to each other. But that constraint goes away if you uh, make, if you allow for loss, if you no longer have R square plus T square equal to 1. So they worked out the exact amount of loss and they put in this resistance, as I said, which is anathema to radio astronomers because every resistance at a finite temperature contributes noise. So you don't want to do that. They did it. And of course, this is one in a whole series of experiments and you can learn more from the people who actually did it. But this excited a lot of interest. Okay? So then people started thinking, is there some kind of theorem behind this? Like, uh, of course, if you put too much resistance, you won't see any signal. <laughs> okay? If you put too little again, you won't see any signal. So you have to be somewhere in between. But the real interesting question, which I'm not going into, the reason why you do correlation interferometry is that you have two independent amplifiers. So when you multiply them, the average of that product is zero. A simpler way to measure a global signal is to point one antenna and then collect all the energy it has, but then you have only one amplifier and uh, you have to live with its uh, noise uh, squared, right? 
so uh, so this excited a lot of interest and uh, uh, I, I also uh, every time I met Ravi he would ask me can you <laughs> tell me what's the correlation between the noise emitted by a resistor in two opposite directions right and how does it depend on the sheet and we would keep debating it and finally I have to stay I, I put it aside because I found a paper which I, I thought was very insightful hmm? so that's going to be my winding up part of the talk uh, this is the title of the paper uh, I'm sure the people in the field know about this paper um, I didn't uh, my fondness for the paper is uh, goes beyond the fact that the second and third authors gave me a very nice dinner <laughs> uh, in an Italian restaurant but this, I think this is an extremely clever paper okay and it, it may also uh, open up something so what did these people say uh, the question is how do you deal with loss right because now it became clear that you do need resistive elements if you want to play this game okay so they said uh, they went back to the idea of an s matrix but in a much more general form hmm? so you have uh, the thing on the top which is uh, the sky okay I, I think i can use my cursor uh, yeah here you are so every source in the sky is an incoherent radiator and they have some model for this uh, then you have these antennas and then of course at low frequencies you worry about everything you worry about the Sharavati lake you worry about trees you worry about grass right so every one of them is modeled by one port of this s matrix I mean the electrical engineers like to call it port the quantum scattering people like to call it channels so the s matrix is a matrix connecting all these channels and each of these channels can either supply something or receive something okay the beauty of this formulation is so if you take maybe some tree which is sitting here it actually uh, it absorbs it also emits and back to Kirchhoff what it emits is related to what it absorbs okay uh, more subtly even each of these telescopes which is actually supposed to absorb radiation also emits I mean the resistors and the amplifiers and so on radiate back so they threw in all this it's not an easy paper to read but the beauty of their formulation is that this S matrix has no loss in it so this this entire space in between is just empty space it conserves energy and you can but you account for all the energy so I think this is something that the condensed matter people would appreciate uh, what is dissipation right is it that energy disappears no it doesn't disappear it goes into some some object and in favorable cases it goes into an object at a certain temperature so that's the viewpoint of this paper and I'm omitting everything except they were now able to actually put constraints on and they were able to recover the earlier results like the beam solid angle and the fact that you need resistance in various setups the fact that mutual coupling is involved so I'm just throwing this out as uh, if this has not yet been covered in the RRI Journal Club someone should do it because it really brings together uh, so many uh, threads right uh, on the one hand current experiments including the ones in RRI on the global signal uh, something as as general as uh, the S matrix which uh, I should have put a picture of Heisenberg and Wheeler here because they invented the H S matrix for very different reasons of course electrical engineers have been using it for a while um, so I'd like to stop here I hope I've brought you from the 17th century into the current century and I guess more than anything it's it's feel so good to be in a place where people have interest in diffraction in fluctuation dissipation theorem or in uh, electronics or antennas or in you know reionization what other place would all these uh, threads come together so it really feels good to be here uh, thank you very much absorb and then radiate. <laughs> so questions. Ha, Satish. So I, I assume in your discussion the coherent length of the sources the coherence hmm. of the sources was assumed to be having a very large uh, 
coherence length for most of this historical Okay, uh, the entire discussion is monochromatic. Exactly. Uh, in that sense, you are right. And coherent. So, at some point I am sure means there was a discussion, especially when you are constructing a diffraction with uh, slits separated out by large distance and so on. So, means when does this uh, come into discussion? Okay, so your question is really about the frequency dependence. Huh? Now, in, in the radio astronomy case, there is actually a spectrometer sitting behind it, which separates the different frequencies. And each channel is narrow, right? But yes, this is uh, important. And it, as you say, it depends on the physical separations. So, one thing I remember hearing from Ravi very early is that uh, he had earlier attempts in Australia, and he said they failed because we did not keep it electrically short. I am using his terminology, right? So, it is exactly the point that you made that if you have large lengths in the system, things are now going to depend on frequency and depend in an oscillatory way. And since what you are looking for is also depending on frequency in an oscillatory way, that is bad news. So, if you go and take a look at these antennas, they are very sort of, <laughs> anyway, the people are here, they can tell you more about it. So, gradually they have evolved to being very chunky <laughs> and, uh, and of course, you need this uh, spectr spectrum, spectrometer. Sort of. Thanks. Yes, yeah, so the question actually relates to the mutual coupling part of it, which is again talking about the length scales and the oscillations corresponding to it. The path that is used for mutual coupling is also the path uh, for the sky signals to come. So, is it even possible to separate out the two effects, which is the crosstalk between, say, the two antennas, mm -hmm. which is through the screen or direct crosstalk? and the monopole component which also comes in through the same channel, right? Is it? Okay, let me make sure I understand. Are you considering, see, the screen setup is not the only setup that uh, yeah. one is talking about. You are thinking of a more general setup, yeah. right? Hmm? So, where you are actually doing interferometry, you have two, two, two antennas. Um, I will tell you the way I find, uh, it simplifies thinking about this. If you think of the way that correlations were measured in the early days of radio astronomy, before they had all these digital correlators, they had the two signals. You combined them either as E1 plus E2 or E1 minus E2 by introducing an extra phase. Of course, making that wavelength independent is a technical problem, but let's say you can do it. Hmm? So then you do E1 plus E2 whole square and E1 minus E2 whole square and you subtract them. I mean, this is Ryle's way of doing. It's called phase switching and all that, right? But this also helps conceptually. Because conceptually what happens is E1 plus E2 whole square is a single telescope, right? right? That single telescope has a beam. It obeys all the theorems and so on. The E1 minus E2 whole square is also another telescope. So that way you get around the problem of understanding correlations. And actually it's true, these two telescopes have very different beams. But uh, both of them will probably have the same effective area. So, if you are in an ideal situation, you are out in space, then uh, both of them, you know, the difference will uh, show up, the global signal. But, yeah. Of course, you have to put in the loss, no? because as we know, if you do not put in the loss, uh, these two will cancel. <laughs> yeah. Huh. The, the S matrix will be unitary provided there is no, uh, the system by itself does not absorb the wave. It is basically what you have said that is that, I mean, uh, un unless everything based on the Kirchhoff law that whatever is received and is also emitted, hmm. there is no self absorption. If there is a self absorption, the S matrix will not be unitary. Okay. So, uh, let me, uh, I talked of two S matrices and maybe I should, uh, in the first example, that S matrix will not be unitary. Once you put some absorbing elements in the screen, it will not be unitary. The, uh, some of the energy will be eaten up. Now, what the later work has done, uh, which I find very attractive, is that uh, every source of dissipation has been become one more channel in the S matrix. Okay? So, so that S matrix is actually unitary and all the power of that paper comes from using unitarity on the giant S matrix, you know, which includes coupling between one antenna and another antenna, I mean all the, so it is a, it's a formalism. Right? 
they also do work it out for some specific cases. So if you find it interesting, you should should really take a look at this. It's, it's a, I think it's a very nice paper. Huh? Uh, Shupurna? No, uh, this reminds me of the usual formulation of system uh, environment coupling, where the total system is unitary, but if you trace out one part, you get an effective dissipation. I, I agree. And I guess this has been known in the condensed matter uh, yeah. community for the some time, yeah. but uh, this the is a clever application to a very practical problem. So mm -hmm. it's interesting that they call it a practical theorem, because most theorems are impractical. <laughs> <It's quantum laughs> like the theorem I told you about. Uh, about super gain antennas, impractical, but uh, this one is practical. Yeah, quantum yeah. Brownian no, no, motion is based uh, on that. And it may Brownian even work if also. different things are at different temperatures. Yeah. You just have to make sure that that balance between what goes in and what comes out. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Huh? This classic uh, kernel. Uh, is it well understood that despite all these holes, uh, how does it work? You mentioned two things that in integration of different function comes out to be same or it's just some chance coincidence? No, I wouldn't call it a coincidence. Uh, see, the Fresnel theory is not, it's not wrong. It's an approximate theory. So in domains where uh, the approximation is valid, huh? so let's go back to this. You are particularly thinking of the straight edge, right? Yes, yes. Hmm. So there is an alternative derivation of the Fresnel theory which doesn't rely on uh, Huygens sources and so on. That is you take the field here and you evolve the field. You, you Fourier expand it and then each plane wave you evolve and then you put them together. At, at the, so uh, I would say that in this forward direction the approximation of the Fresnel theory, okay there are two approximations of Fresnel theory. One is paraxial, the other is the assumption that this is the undisturbed field. Which is the wrong assumption. That's what's worrying you, right? Actually, that, that should probably be regarded as one of those, uh, one of those pieces of luck. <laughs> it need not have happened. I mean, think of Bohr theory, right? I mean, he got the exact energy, but by assuming the angular momentum to be one rather than zero. So, <laughs> some people have all the luck. Okay. There's two parts. Hmm. So um, this is Prasoon. I had a couple of questions. One for the edge web of um, Summerfield. Is there a renormalization going on when you are looking from far away? The integrations of the edge currents being lost. Uh, the second is the reciprocity theorem can be understood in terms of Green's function easily. Is there any more fundamental way of looking at the proof? The Neumann or maybe Cauchy boundary conditions do not have a direct symmetry in Green's function. Does it still hold in the field propagation on a nonlinear medium? Okay, uh, let me try and. Uh, I guess whatever I'm saying is audible at the other end to the person who is online. Okay, great. So. Uh, so first of all, actually, the Neumann and uh, Dirichlet green functions are different, which is why Rayleigh and Sommerfeld got two answers, right? I mean, depending on which condition they put, and neither condition is physically justified. Okay? Now, coming to nonlinear, I think that's a completely new ball game. I think uh, linearity has been assumed uh, in whatever I talked about, uh, yeah, yeah, in the propagation and so on. And uh, the first question, I'm, I'm taking it in reverse order. So is there a renormalization going on when you are hmm. looking, at, uh, looking from far away? It's not uh, so much a renormalization as the fact perhaps that the currents which are distributed over a small region, if you go very far away, they look like currents emanating from the edge. I mean, so plus higher multipoles uh, perhaps, yeah. So I mean, it is just free propagation beyond that point. 